Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, our monthly webinar series. I'm Jennifer Smith and I'm here with my partner, Amy Dickerson. And Hi. Amy, I should have said. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're, today we're talking about um, preparing for 2023. And we're gonna focus on um, discussions to have, trainings to plan, procedures to make sure are in place. Um, so I, I think that's a good topic. I'm, we're starting to get a lot of requests about trainings this summer and questions. So I know everyone's still trying to finish out this school year, but it is uh, right around the corner to prepare for next school year. Um, so with that, um, if you have any follow-up questions, we, well, we only have 30 minutes. Um, so we're gonna move pretty quick through a lot of topics, but always reach out or put your questions in the Q and A um, tab, as opposed to the comments that it helps us track and be able to respond if we are able to. Um, so with that, Amy, I'll turn it over to you to kick off. We're gonna start with the uh, three discussions we're gonna uh, recommend having uh, for the 2022-23 school year. Yep, thanks Jennifer and hello everyone. Um, yeah, we you know kind of wanted to start off with highlighting some of the key issues that may be top of mind for your board and administrative teams when thinking about the upcoming year, or might become top of mind as the the months um, you know get closer to the start of the school year. And you know we'll talk in a moment about particular trainings that we would recommend you um, have in place for your staff and administrators, as well as procedures that you wanna be sure to have in addition to sort of those required policies and procedures we always have. Um, but the particular areas we wanted to focus on first were topics that we think would be worthy of you know, discussion um, and meaningful discussion with your administrative teams or boards or both, um, really to help identify you know, the approach that your districts and schools will take to address these issues, to help inform what communications you might put out on those issues, what procedures you might wanna have, um, what trainings you wanna, you wanna involve your, your staff on. Um, and so the first discussion that we'd recommend having is really on the role of the school resource officer in your schools, as well as the process that your schools currently utilize and, um, and what you would expect your schools would be doing when it comes to referring certain matters to law enforcement. Um, this is a topic that has garnered a lot of attention lately in light of the recent ProPublica investigation that's been reported on by the Chicago Tribune. Um, and so we wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the issues that may be appropriate um, to be talking about internally if you're not already doing so. So Jennifer, do you wanna talk a bit more kind of about the article and what came from it initially? Sure, so um, the, so far there's been a, a series of two articles. Um, the, first, the first being a couple of weeks ago and then the second one being more recently. I'm, I don't have any inside information on if there's more articles, although my understanding is the reporters continue to ask questions uh, around these topics. So I wouldn't, wouldn't be shocked if there, were, there uh, is more reporting coming. But um, big picture, the articles have focused on school district practices uh, in referring matters to law enforcement that results in law enforcement issuing tickets that have fines associated with them. And the, I don't know, big picture concept that some interviewed for the article gave is that this is, does an end run around SB 100. And while I think there's even in the articles acknowledgement that it doesn't violate, it doesn't violate the law. It doesn't violate SB 100 because schools are not finding students um, that the intent, it was, schools are still, the end result is that students get fines for conduct in schools at times because of the law enforcement tickets. So um, the initial article prompted a response from Dr. Ayala um, in a statement saying that schools should consider not referring things to law enforcement in consideration that they're gonna result in a fine. 
Um, she referenced guidance that ISBE has available about different ways to address student conduct. And that kind of brings us to where we are right now as far as recommending a discussion. I think there's a lot to unpack and a lot um, that needs to be kind of thought about in terms of district practices for how they handle behavior, how they partner with law enforcement uh, for, for certain kinds of behavior. And, and Amy, maybe you could set the stage a little bit more for that discussion in terms of um, what are what is required or what are best practices as far as communicating with law enforcement. Yeah, sure. Um, and so we actually put out an alert relatively recently um, that highlights some of the, the, the key points um, to kind of consider with these discussions. Um, you, you know, one is to be aware of what the current, you know, there are certain circumstances where school officials um, by statute are required to report student activity to local law enforcement. That in, this includes certain written complaints of battery committed against school personnel, um, firearms on school property, just to name a couple. We've got those listed in our alert on our website. Um, so it's important to, you know, start from a premise of, of understanding that there are certain circumstances where you need to do that. And, and, and then, um, you know, really- And Amy, I mean, before, before we move on, I just think that's such an important point that was completely missed by the article and the tone of the article that, um, as if schools have a, a choice. I mean, if, if legislature, if, if we decide as a state, we don't want things reported to law enforcement that happen in schools, then these laws need to be looked at. But they are currently on the books. They, schools are, if you're, if you're school complying with the law, you are, you are reporting certain things to law enforcement. And that's not a judgment on, hey, we're trying to, to get kids to have tickets. Or, or fine. So I feel like that that point was not made at all in the articles, and it's just a really important one to think about if if you're looking at reforming this area. Well, you only have so much latitude unless there's a law change. Yep. And, and, and then, you know, with, the, with that in mind, it's sort of also kind of furthering, you know, identifying, you know, where are we at? Where's your school at um, on this issue? Um, you know, reviewing why, how'd you get there? And, 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 and what, where, where do you want to be as a district if there's any, you know, modifications to be made um, in light of, you know, your school and district and community, but then also the issues that have been raised through the article, but then especially through um, Dr. Ayala statement. So another way, you know, in addition to kind of making sure you're clear on what your statutory requirements are, is looking at your reciprocal reporting agreements that you have with your local law enforcement. Um, those are, you know, to, um, you know, there's a call within the school code to develop those with your, your parent advisory groups. Um, but to look at those first to see what are they currently requiring in terms of um, reporting any student misconduct or exchanging information. Are there any additional requirements in that reporting agreement that you need to be aware of that's currently there or, you know, language that, it, that doesn't require reporting but that permits you to do that? And then really finding out from your administrative teams then how is this actually looking in, in practice? Um, so, you know, some things to be mindful of is whether your district, you know, not only has those reciprocal reporting agreements, if you cross boundaries with different villages, you know, looking to see, you know, what all of those look like, um, how recently have they been updated. Um, this is a big part of what, you know, we do when we're working with schools is, is helping to review and make sure that those are keeping with the best practices for those reporting agreements, especially when it comes to any um, SROs that are placed in your schools and making sure that you have the proper, you know, the information in there that you'd want to have in terms of um, training requirements, expectations for those officers, things like that. Um, you'd want to know then, you know, what's the types of conduct that are called for to be reported under that agreement. Um, if there is specific 
um, criminal conduct to be reported, you know, understanding the distinction between suspected criminal code violations and municipal code violations and, and the effects of such reporting. Um, you know, so we would, you know, recommend reviewing those agreements, recommend, frankly, doing those often, you know, with some of these questions in mind, and then really considering updates um, that may be appropriate um, in light of, you know, what's currently in your agreements, um, the process that's set forth by your district's parent teacher advisory committee, um, and some of the issues then that were raised in light of Dr. Um, Ayala's recent statement. Um, we, you know, we would expect to see some legislation attempted to be pushed, um, you know, relatively recently and possibly even, you know, prior to the start of the school year that touches on some of the subjects um, that were raised in the um, in the articles um, and that are raised in Dr. Ayala's statement. So we'll certainly be monitoring for that. And of course, anything that would address some of, that would affect some of the areas that we're talking about, you know, we would then, um, you'd wanna make sure that you're complying with as well. Um, you know, the article did talk a little bit about truancy issues as well. Jennifer, do you wanna to touch on that a bit? Sure, so uh, the, the article specifically talked about truancy tickets. And um, it is true that the law changed uh, relatively recently and there are very, schools should not be uh, referring students for tickets uh, for truancy. Um, that, that there is, that, that's different than SB 100 and the no fines and, and it being an end run. There is just a direct law that, that schools should not refer students for tickets. However, um, that same law allows that once a district follows certain steps and provides certain resources, you can refer parents for tickets. So it could be that a parent gets ticketed. Now, I mean, I'm not hearing a great deal of that, but it's one of those things that sometimes gets on autopilot and you might just wanna check what your practices are and make sure that if you're still doing the same thing that you did 15 years ago, it probably does need to be updated because there have been changes in the law in this area. So it's one to just do a, a, an internal audit. What are, what are our truancy you know, practices? Is there someone who thinks that what we do is refer students for tickets because that's what we've always done and it just didn't get turned off, so to speak, when the law changed? So um, that's another thing that was raised in the article. So um, with that, um, next we wanted to shift. So that's our first discussion point. Our second discussion point in some ways overlaps because the article did talk about, the second article in the series talked about equity and disproportionality and who was receiving, which uh, the demographics of the students receiving the tickets. Um, which uh, kind of segues us into the equity topic. And so, um, Amy, I wanted it, wondered if you could share what's new in the area of equity that schools should be thinking about for next year. Yeah, um, and so, you know, we, um, you know, we're able to provide um, over the course of um, a, a lot last year, a monthly webinar series that really focused on educational equity and brought in and where we were able to hear from school districts and administrators throughout the state and how districts were really approaching um, equity work at their districts and in particular, you know, approaching addressing inequities that they saw um, among different students populations and especially inequities between um, non-white students and their student peers and, and way, really talking about ways to, to approach um, those issues and work with your school communities. Um, and so those are all um, still on our, our website. And so we encourage you if you weren't able to, um, to previously view those and are looking to see you know, how districts are approaching this work throughout the state to do that. Um, but what we will see um, coming this, this school year um, is an initiative that's really in line with ISBE's strategic, current strategic plan. 
um, where starting in October of 2022, on every school district's report card, there will be a section that will appear that will share how, what, where each district is on their equity journey continuum. Um, and this is really going to be focused on data and outcomes and identifying wh where there are any equity gaps among different areas within the, the school district. This is all based on data that each school district has already provided um, to the State Board of Education. And it's basically repurposing that information through an equity lens. It's to serve as an informational tool um, to then helpfully according to ISB help inform then how, what districts, um, you know, might, it might inform action steps that districts might take in light of um, any equity gaps that are identified through this process, but would not be something that um, is, that there's any sort of mandate or accountability structure in place that if a district um, has a certain, you know, wider gap in certain areas that they would be required to take certain steps. Um, there is, if you go on ISBE's webpage, if you're not already familiar with this um, continuum, if you look up on their, you know, their, equi their main equity landing page, there is a lot of resources and fact sheets and information on um, what to expect um, for the, the upcoming report card, including an FAQ that was recently um, updated. Um, but to briefly just share what will appear, we don't know exactly how yet it will look on the report card, um, but each district will, um, there will be, there'll be a level of, you know, of an equity gap that will be identified for one of three areas. Um, student learning, learning conditions, and elevating educators. And within each of those areas, um, the districts or the, um, the, the equity journey continuum level that is assigned to each one of those areas will be based on various data related to that category. So for example, in the area of student learning, um, districts will be assessed based on data regarding their advanced um, course enrollment placements, on-time graduation rates, um, IAR and SAT test scores to name a few. And each area will be assigned one of four step levels along the continuum, either having a large gap in equity in that particular category, a moderate gap in equity, a small or a minimal gap in equity. So for the area of student learning, for example, the report card would show if there's a large, moderate, small or minimum gap in equity in the area of student learning based on information that the district has reported in those areas, such as on-time graduation rates and you know, in algebra and enrollment and, and pass rates in that area. Um, the individual measurements on the, the data points that are used to inform what those broader areas will be will not be available visible um, on the report card. So it will just be the broader areas of student learning, learning condition, and elevating educators. And then districts will have an opportunity to provide a narrative that would appear on the report card to provide some context to that. Um, so as you'll see, if you, um, when you look at the, you know, the FAQ and learn more about this, um, the, the, what this is going to look like, um, you know, a few important points. One, you can go now um, and log in, your districts can go in um, and log into the report card system and see um, what your data looks like and where your district will be, um, what levels your district would be assigned in each of these categories um, for the October 22 report card. Importantly, the data that will be used for this fall's report card is based on data from the 2018-2019 school year. Um, which is due to disruption and learning related to the pandemic. Going forward, it would be based on the previous school year's um, information. So, you know, with that, one, there is a narrative statement that districts will be allowed to put in. So to the extent that, especially given the lack of, um, you know, the, the time gap that, that that information is going to be from, and a district wants to provide context as to what their 
current data points may look like or what work they've been doing in the interim to address some gaps that you may already be aware of, that narrative will be um, um, you know, available for districts to utilize to provide that context. But then in terms of discussions, you know, because districts can go in now and see what that looks like, um, you know, it, it would be, um, you know, I think an important consideration to, to actually go ahead and do that and see where, what, what, what you would expect to have appear for your report cards in the fall and, you know, and, and talk through if, um, you know, that's something that you think will be a source of discussion or confusion, since this is the first point time that that's going to be appearing on the report cards, that might be worthwhile to have some additional communication with your school communities, with your boards, internal, external communications, to let them know this is something new, um, this is what's going, what it's going to appear, this is what's going to appear for our school district, um, and provide some additional context as well as we appropriate. Um, you know, I'm very familiar um, with kind of under trying to figure out the nuances of this new um, continuum since it's new for districts, so feel free to reach out if there's questions. But like I said, ISBE has a lot of resources on their websites as well. Um, and then finally, you know, the other important area that we wanted, that we wanted to highlight that we thought is worthy of some thoughtful discussion with your teams and boards is the district's approach to addressing any COVID-19 surges that may arise in the upcoming year, as well as the ongoing mitigation measures that the school, your schools may have in place or have at the ready to implement if necessary. I um, mean, you know, we do know in April that, um, Dr. Ayala did put out a statement that really urged school districts then to have a emergency plan in place in the event of a surge and identified particular things to have in that plan, such as ensuring adequate testing supplies, um, a method to calculate PPE usage, compliance with infection control procedures, and compliance with case reporting requirements and handling of cases in close contact. Contacts. Um, in light of the, um, you know, litigation that we know has also been going on throughout the state, you know, Jennifer, is there any additional insight to provide for things for districts to consider as they're especially thinking about, you know, going into next school year and as of unknowns as to where we might be with the pandemic? Yeah, so um, honestly, Amy, when I saw this come out, just from a litigation perspective, it made me nervous because there continue to be new lawsuits. Many, many, many lawsuits have been filed that are alleging that um, the, are challenging masking and close contact quarantines. Let me tell you, that's the area of, of controversy. And they're alleging that those are only temporarily halted. And so they're pursuing lawsuits now to try to prevent the reinstatement of those in the future. Um, and so just have a discussion with your attorney about where you're going to go on this and know whether you, you're currently a party to one of those lawsuits and, and there might be some different things to think about. If you're not currently a party and you just want an overview of, hey, what are some considerations uh, we should think about, um, it, it's just fair to say that schools are getting sued for having these plans in place and if you have a, a trigger and plan to have a mask requirement or plan to have a close con contact quarantining, um, I guess I'll just say that is a hotly litigated area right now. Not that I'm saying I'm not giving a legal opinion here on whether that violates the law, but that is a discussion you should have in consultation with your attorney. So then moving on to trainings, and uh, we don't have a whole lot of time, so maybe we'll, we'll move pretty quickly, but Amy, what are your thoughts on trainings that folks should have uh, think about for the summer? Yeah, so, you know, we know that there are required trainings that um, school districts, you know, need to provide to their staff, you know, and various levels of staff. So we won't go through that exhaustive list. If you have questions about that, you know, by all means, feel free to contact us. Um, you know, but the particular ones we wanted to just highlight, and I'll really just flag them, and 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 then we're happy to chat to chat more. Um, but one is specifically on you know training on your comprehensive 
um, threat assessment models that you are using at your school to process threats that come in in accordance with your threat assessment procedures. Um, prior to the pandemic, there was new legislation in Illinois that does require and still requires that each school district have a threat assessment procedure in place. We developed a model threat assessment procedure that is still current um, and available if that would be helpful for you. Um, if yours needs updated, there is a new law that was just enacted that requires school districts to provide a copy of that procedure to your local law enforcement agency and your ROE. Um, but that's a procedure that's to identify sort of what your structure is in place in terms of your district and school level threat assessment teams. Um, but when we talk about training, um, you know, we strongly recommend that you utilize a um, research-based methodical process and protocol for actually triaging and processing threats that come through. Um, you know, it really can be critical to have a, you know, um, a, a well-researched and, and based protocol that is methodical, that is unbiased, that all of your district staff are trained on in how to use that. So an example of that is, you know, the University of Virginia's comprehensive threat assessment model that um, it's actually Dewey Cornell is at the University of Virginia, but it's his model that that um, his team has um, put out that I, we know a number of districts are trained on in Illinois. And so again, we can provide more information on that, but that's something to really review to see are your teams up to speed with that. Um, some additional trainings that we recommend making sure you have in place are on um, Title IX and making sure all your teams who are implementing your procedures um, are appropriately trained, as well as then more broadly, those who are um, handling your complaint investigations generally have appropriate training on that. Jennifer, do you want to talk a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, the key thing to know, I think, on Title IX is that the law hasn't yet changed. We expect new regulations, but for the upcoming school year, um, basically, ever since it, uh, the regulations got updated in 2020, those, those are the requirements that are going to be in place for the upcoming school year. Um, so the main thing, if you've already been trained or uh, largely been trained, just think about what what administrative changes are you're making and if people are in different roles. Um, we I'm sure that we will be offering either group training or individual training or we have recorded training. So we have all kinds of options. Um, if you have just one person, for example, who needs to get trained, just flag, wanted to flag that. Um, and the complaint investigations I've, I included that more because we are seeing, and I think everyone is seeing, so many um, parent and community complaints on wide ranging topics and, um, you know, increasing your staff capacity to, when you get a parent complaint, what do you do? You know, looking at your board policy, understanding is this a type of complaint that what, what procedure needs to be followed for this type of complaint? And then what does it mean to investigate? Um, what does that look like in a school setting? What are the best practices? Just getting a lot of questions this spring on that. And that's something that we can help you build your internal capacity to have administrators that are, are able to take on all those complaints you're getting these days. Um, Next, we have the residency and homeless um, intake process. Um, that's something, Amy, it did, um, the law changed a few years ago, but especially with COVID and all the, the changes, I think as we start back to a truly in-person year, that's, that's something to just check that you, you are using the current uh, uh, practices. Again, if you're doing the same thing you did 15 years ago, this is a good time to, to refresh because the law has changed. Absolutely. And especially making sure that those frontline staff that you have that are processing the residency paperwork and maybe the first lines of communication for additional information from families where necessary or referring certain families to supports and services in the district, depending upon what comes up through that paperwork, it can be really critical to make sure that you, um, you know, are on the same page with those, you know, that are processing those to make sure that um, they understand all 
all the different forms you have, when to get more information, when to connect a family to somebody within the administration or to have further conversations internally um, to make sure that you're following all that needs to be and that would be in line with best practices there. So well, Amy, I'm not sure we're already at 30 minutes, so we'll have to maybe schedule a follow-up to talk about um, the uh, the procedures uh, that people should think about and, and pe folks can definitely reach out. We are gonna talk about a lot of the same areas that we talked about the training. So whether it be Title IX, your uniform grievance procedures, your bullying procedure, um, residency procedures and forms, curriculum objection procedures, um, check out our webinar that um, we have posted on that if, if you're give, getting a curriculum objection. Um, employee code of conduct, that's new legislation, Amy. I know we, we don't really have time, but that's something to flag that um, there's a new requirement for an employee code of conduct um, having to do with student boundaries, um, uh, student discipline, uh, and then reciprocal reporting agreements and an anaphylaxis policy. So that whew, got through. Uh, didn't, didn't really have time to provide a lot of detail, but just to put some uh, things in your mind. So uh, we would like to thank you for joining us today. If you're interested in receiving more information about any of these trainings or toolkits or um, uh, policies, please reach out. Feel free to reach out to any forensic attorney. Um, and join us next month. Um, I think that we'll have a different, um, I believe Scott Medcalf, one of our partners, will be joined by some of our team. And um, and so please uh, look for that. And thanks for joining today.